Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this session. Um, I didn't include my disclosures. Our institution gets research support from Siemens, and we have funding from the National Institutes of Health. So uh, not necessarily in this order, but sort of mixed together, we'll look at different clinical scenarios and techniques, um, some limitations with what we do in future directions. And this is a fairly rare condition, but I thought I'd take you through this in terms of um, tests that we currently use and where tissue characterization, I think, can make a tremendous difference. So um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a genetic disorder um, that affects muscle and the heart is involved as well. Um, quote, unquote, asymptomatic, but wheelchair bound, so he's not going to come in and say, I get short of breath when I walk upstairs. Um, the question is, does he need tissue characterization? And, and um, very universally available is a simple test called the electrocardiogram. And you might appreciate some abnormalities here uh, with uh, uh, this prominent R prime in the right side of precordial leads. As I mentioned, it's a, a genetic disorder, generally wheelchair bound by the age of 12 to 13. Um, you may not have typical signs and symptoms of cardiomyopathy. But certainly by the uh, 20s and 30s, um, unfortunately, these young people die of cardiopulmonary disease. And if you look at um, autopsies, hearts, uh, it's very common to see cardiac involvement. In fact, there's virtually 100% prevalence of myocardial disease in these boys. Histopathologically, it's uh, fibrosis and some fatty replacement of normal muscle. There's a very uh, characteristic pattern of involvement. So it tends to start in the basal, infralateral, or posterior wall, which may explain the EKG abnormality with the tall R prime uh, in the right-sided precordial leads. But it eventually becomes very diffuse. Um, they may have acute episodes, almost a myocarditis-like picture. Um, or they may have problems when they have uh, non-cardiac uh, issues. So they come in with pneumonia, and that stress may precipitate a cardiac presentation. Um, and uh, unfortunately, sudden death or arrhythmia may be the first manifestation of cardiomyopathy. So we talked about the 19-year-old uh, young man. He had uh, some abnormalities on the EKG. So he underwent an echocardiogram. And the echo was read as a normal LV ejection fraction, LV systolic function, normal chamber size. So again, I would ask you, does this patient need tissue characterization? And you could say, well, we could do cardiac MR for several reasons. Certainly the uh, ability to measure function, as you heard about this morning, uh, it's really considered the gold standard. And this is uh, maybe even concerning data that uh, the Vanderbilt group put together that said, well, if we thought the function was normal by echocardiography and we think of MR as the gold standard, can we be reassured by a normal echo? And perhaps that's not the case. As you can see, modest at best correlation between uh, echo and MR in this population. So these were Duchenne patients. And perhaps the limitation of acoustic windows is melt, felt more acutely in these patients with uh, often uh, contractures, scoliosis, et cetera. But again, the, the strength of MR really for this population is in its tissue characterization. And in fact, same 19-year-old young man, um, the ECG that looked a little bit abnormal, the echo looked completely normal. Um, MR, LGE uh, tells you that things are not all normal. So there's evident myocardial damage, which is subclinical at this point. So what do we do with this information? Well, we had an idea, um, our group at Ohio State, saying that perhaps at this stage we can intervene. So we went back to a mouse model and uh, asked if some medications that we have uh, classically thought of as having an antifibrotic effect, um, such as ACE inhibitors and aldosterone antagonists, might have an impact. So in these mice, we sort of had three groups, um, the untreated, those in which we considered starting therapy later, typically when the ejection fraction might fall, or starting treatment earlier. And as you can see, um, we really had a, we had an improvement at any stage, but more so if we started early. So we're in the process of testing that in a clinical trial um, with the entry criteria being evident myocardial damage by tissue characterization, but preserved LV systolic function by CINE imaging. Uh, this is just a kind of a list we can use of 
variety of approaches looking at uh, MR relaxation parameters to characterize the myocardium. And of course, late gadolinium enhancement is really our workhorse technique. It was initially developed to look at infarct scar. This is uh, some classic uh, images from uh, circulation study in 1999. And the goal is simply to maximize contrast between uh, infarcted or scarred myocardium and the normal tissue. And we see histopathologic verification that, in fact, that's what we're imaging. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so the uh, first application was looking at infarct extent uh, or the corollary to that is viability imaging. And in fact, the transmural extent of SCAR turns out to be inversely proportional to the likelihood of functional recovery. This example, I think, is illuminating in how tissue characterization really is very complementary to function. You know, if this patient underwent an echocardiogram, as you can see by cine imaging, function is not uh, at least obviously abnormal, uh, but yet there's infarct scar within that tissue. Uh, it then was extended to look at a variety of forms of non-ischemic uh, cardiac disease. So here's an example in a patient with congestive heart failure, very significant LV systolic dysfunction. You can see we used a real-time cine imaging technique because of his difficulty with breath holding. And on late gadolinium enhancement imaging, we see the typical mid-wall enhancement pattern that is very indicative of non-ischemic myocardial disease. So this is not coronary occlusion-induced infarction, but rather uh, a fibrosis pattern that we associate with non-ischemic disease. And this distinction then um, has therapeutic implications. So this is, a, I think, a classic report where they took patients that had been uh, diagnosed with cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy and had also undergone coronary angiograms. And the initial classification of ischemic versus non-ischemic cardiomyopathy was based on the angiogram, so that if they had non-obstructive disease or normal coronaries, they were thought to have non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and if they had obstructive disease, they were deemed to have ischemic cardiomyopathy. But when you look at the myocardium, so you shift your focus from the coronary arteries to the muscle downstream, you get perhaps a slightly different story. As expected, those with coronary disease had infarct scar, um, but those uh, patients without coronary disease could have been LG negative, they might have that mid-wall enhancement, but fully 13% of those patients actually had infarct scar uh, in the myocardium. So what did that mean? That means they probably had an infarct remotely and the epicardial uh, vessel recanalized. So there was not a major residual stenosis on angiography, but the signature of infarction was there um, by LGE CMR. And here's an example of uh, how that makes a difference. Here's a gentleman that presented with um, LV dysfunction and as a consideration of preventing sudden death, he was referred for defibrillator placement. They had initial difficulty getting uh, venous access, so he was admitted and the, you know, sort of the thinking clinicians who were taking care of him in the hospital said, well, let's better define his substrate for arrhythmia. So he was referred for CMR and he had not only infarct scar, but perhaps a region of microvascular obstruction. So his diagnosis changed from dilated non-ischemic cardiomyopathy to ischemic cardiomyopathy with the attendant change in, for example, secondary prevention uh, treatment goals. Another pattern is shown here. This is a young man with chest pain and premature ventricular beats. So again, the referral for tissue characterization came from the electrophysiology laboratory. And here on late enhancement imaging, I hope you can appreciate this area of sort of mid to epicardial wall enhancement. Um, with the cough, he underwent chest imaging that showed various nodularities. And uh, together, these findings constituted a diagnosis of sarcoidosis. So you would think, well, CMR should make it a chip shot to make uh, the diagnosis of sarcoid disease. 
Um, but in fact, we see many LGE patterns for this disease. And we also, unfortunately, see the same pattern of LGE in sarcoidosis as we see in some other diseases. So we still have some unmet needs in terms of specificity of diagnosis. Uh, another condition is shown here. This is uh, an inmate. We have the privilege of OSU of taking care of the uh, Ohioans uh, behind bars. And he presented with sort of flu-like symptoms. And uh, as you can see on his EKG, he had uh, probably an arrhythmia. This is ventricular tachycardia that caused him to pass out. Initial blood work indicated that he had myocardial damage. So the next test he underwent, given the, uh, the symptoms, the troponin elevation, was an invasive coronary angiogram. And this showed not really anything to go after in terms of obstructive disease, but it did offer a clue to uh, what was going on in the setting of LV systolic dysfunction. So with the troponin elevation and LV systolic dysfunction, myocarditis was suspected. And here's a chance for CMR to um, uh, aid in management and diagnosis. So, Again, fairly short of breath. We use real-time cine imaging uh, quite often. And late gadolinium enhancement shows a very typical pattern of epicardial enhancement that allows us to make the diagnosis of myocarditis. Even with this, the uh, particular clinicians involved decided it was still worth getting an endomyocardial biopsy. So they took him to the invasive laboratory and found, in fact, a large burden of inflammatory cells on histopathologic examination. Um, we've extended our uh, tissue characterization in myocarditis to include T2 imaging because it can show us regions of involvement that we might not appreciate by LGE alone. Uh, but why did this patient get a biopsy? So let's think about the value of tissue characterization in myocarditis. Well, it certainly helped us make the right diagnosis in this patient. Although the clinical suspicion was high, that epicardial pattern of enhancement on LGE um, helped us really seal the diagnosis. And with the right diagnosis, we can then institute the appropriate treatments. And you could say, well, if there's LV dysfunction, we could detect that by echocardiography, and we would apply some cardioprotective medicines regardless of the cause, right? For example, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. Um, other treatments, however, might be very um, uh, selective in our uh, distribution. So in myocarditis, there's a chance of recovery of LV function. So we might defer, for example, placement of a defibrillator until the um, ventricle can be reassessed. In this instance, because of the ventricular tachycardia, the endomyocardial biopsy was still needed um, to exclude a diagnosis of giant cell myocarditis. And uh, that, in certain centers, really does prompt much more aggressive immunomodulatory and immunosuppressive therapy. So we are, we're not quite at the stage yet with tissue characterization where we can uh, establish that uh, level of specificity. Another example is uh, shown here. This is a diabetic who presented with probably, in retrospect, heart failure type symptoms and very tachycardic with frequent runs of ventricular tachycardia on telemetry, um, nothing obstructive by coronary angiography. And so putting this together, the team thought he might have tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. And you can see at baseline fairly severe LV systolic dysfunction. Although LGE was negative, his myocardial T2 values were markedly elevating, elevated. Um, what's in, really, I think, intriguing here is that post-ablation, uh, they were able to eliminate his tachycardia. You can see that his LV systolic function improves considerably. His T2s came down, and uh, he's left again without any apparent myocardial damage by LGE. This is another uh, common indication for uh, CMR referral. Um, although the door through which this patient came in was a little bit different in terms of how we got to the diagnosis. So he was referred primarily for atrial fibrillation and vein mapping um, prior to ablation. But the uh, CMR team noted that he had a history of LV systolic dysfunction that had not been characterized more precisely. So instead of just doing the pulmonary vein MRA, we talked to the referring team and uh, suggested the cardiomyopathy evaluation as well. And I think you can appreciate on cine imaging this marked uh, dyskinesis in the right ventricle. Uh, 
and overall RV systolic dysfunction and by LGE uh, areas of enhancement in the RV myocardium. And so he was diagnosed with arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy. But as um, Dr. Banditini pointed out this morning, we really don't use tissue characterization to make the diagnosis of ARVC. We, uh, to get in the guidelines, we in CMR still have to get measures of RV function and uh, RV size. So where could tissue characterization fit in or where should we look at um, generating the evidence needed to change management. It could be, for instance, in better risk stratification. You know, it's often in those um, uh, younger patients, particularly those that might be genopositive relatives I identified from a proband that's affected with the disease, uh, where there may not be a very obvious phenotype with RV systolic dysfunction. Um, but until we have better natural history studies, I think it will be uh, uncertain as to where tissue characterization falls in this uh, population. Um, this is a, a gentleman who was driving down the road and was stopped by the police because he was crossing over the midline. When they stopped him, he seemed a little disoriented and short of breath, so they took him to the hospital. And his troponin was abnormal. Uh, his electrocardiogram showed poor R-wave progression, so there was some concern that he might have had a heart attack, myocardial infarction, so he was taken to the cath lab, and his coronary angiogram showed some disease, but nothing high grade to warrant coronary intervention. Um, so then he underwent an echocardiogram that showed increased wall thickness, and in, excuse me, in combination with the EKG, amyloidosis was suspected. So logically, you know, I'm giving this talk at ISMRM. We're talking about tissue characterization with MR. So does anybody want to guess what the next test he had was? I think I heard CMR. Okay. Abdominal fat pad biopsy. Okay. Now this is actually a very good uh, way of making the diagnosis. And he had uh, what are known as these birefringent deposits on uh, microscopic examination. And then he went to a heart failure and a hematology specialist who then ordered CMR. So I tell you this story just because sometimes we, um, we may lose sight of where we fit, you know, as a tremendous imaging technology in the bigger picture. Um, but it, it's uh, reassuring to know that the clinicians saw the value of CMR in this instance um, to, I guess, confirm cardiac involvement. And our technique here considered, consisted of real-time imaging again. Uh, the TI scout shows the very distinct changes in amyloid disease with uh, difficult to null normal myocardium. Uh, coincidentally, we thought there was uh, perhaps an appendage thrombus here, something we don't see very often, but uh, appreciable with a long inversion time LGE acquisition. And then we really nail the diagnosis with quantitative T1 mapping. And, you know, my colleague Lon Simonetti always installs our latest and greatest sequences on our scanner, and he says, no, 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 you can't just use T1 maps, you got to use T1 star, right, for the blood signal. So we sit down and do the math, and this was, I think, extremely high ECV value um, that really made it unequivocal as to what the diagnosis was. And this has emerged uh, as a very exciting technique. Uh, you see a lot of um, activity in this field. Uh, this was, a, I think, one of the early papers that got people excited of, as to the ability to look at interstitial fibrosis. And just qualitatively, I think you can see in this patient on the right with hypertensive heart disease, very abnormal uh, T1 map and a resulting extracellular volume fraction that was much higher than the, that seen in healthy controls. And now we are looking not only at a diagnostic uh, value, but prognostic value. And this was from uh, Tim Wong and Eric Shelbert at University of Pittsburgh showing the incremental prognostic value of this ECV measurement beyond very classic predictors such as age, ejection fraction, et cetera. T2 imaging has been uh, used as well for tissue characterization. Roberto Curry's uh, paper here shows that in patients presenting with chest pain, we can distinguish um, acute uh, coronary syndrome and, again, acute from chronic infarct was shown by the Berlin uh, investigators here. But T2-weighted imaging can be challenged by 
um, various sources of artifact. Either the stagnant blood may cause signal that's adjacent to the myocardium, or if you don't use the proper coil uh, correction algorithms, you may falsely see increased signal. Uh, it may be a relatively low contrast technique, so here this patient with a known acute inferior MI maybe has subtler changes, and there's obviously uh, motion sensitivity. So instead, uh, we've moved increasingly for T2 imaging to quantitative T2 mapping. And uh, I've shown you one example in the patient with myocarditis. Here is a study from David Verhart, uh, who's in Belgium now, showing measurable uh, differences in myocardial T2 values in infarcted versus remote and healthy myocardium. And other causes of chest pain, so this is uh, a lady who had chest pain and troponin elevation. Not only does a CINE imaging tell you this sort of classic phenotype of Takasubo cardiomyopathy, but the T2 was uh, informative as well. And then we talked about sarcoidosis and the potential limitation of LGE, that the pattern may not be specific. Um, perhaps T2 can be complementary in this setting because it is inherently an inflammatory myocardial disease. And we showed that this not only uh, helped with the diagnosis, but perhaps uh, helps with risk stratification and that higher T2 values seem to accompany uh, arrhythmias and ECG abnormalities. <clears throat> And then finally, I think one of the great success stories of CMR, T2 star mapping as a measure of iron content here. You can see the rapid fall off in liver signal in this patient with sickle cell disease who's received lifelong transfusions. Uh, some groups have used it to look at intramyocardial hem hemorrhage um, with a distinct abnormality uh, in comparison to the other techniques. Uh, but where it's really made a huge impact in patients' lives is in thalassemia. And here you can see the um, arrhythmic events are much higher with the shorter T2 star in myocardium. Uh, here's an example of a lady that uh, showed up uh, on the inpatient service with heart failure. Again, lifelong transfusions due to myelodysplasia and extremely short T2 star both in the myocardium as well as the liver. When deployed uh, through the National Health Service in the UK where this is a common cause of heart failure, you can see that after the introduction of CMR as a routine practice uh, to screen for cardiac iron overload, uh, tremendous impact because this uh, tissue characterization, this biomarker of cardiac disease then guides therapy, for example, more intensive use of chelation. And uh, I think it's a great example of how tissue characterization can save lives. So the last uh, bit I wanted to talk about, you've heard um, from several speakers today on guidelines. So how do we move the bar in terms of guidelines? These are just some of the heart failure guidelines. And I wanted to draw your attention to this classification of cardiomyopathy based on, for example, stage A, when someone's at risk but without st structural heart disease or symptoms. Stage B, which typically means the ejection fraction is reduced, but that person doesn't have signs or symptoms of heart failure. Um, stage C, they have symptoms, and stage D is more advanced disease. And the reason I think this is something we should pay attention to as CMR um, uh, practitioners is stage B cardiomyopathy then prompts cardioprotective treatment, for example, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. Should we now consider tissue characterization as an opportunity to redefine stage B cardiomyopathy? And I think you all have seen this paper that came out in JAMA last year, a very large uh, study that showed tremendous incremental prognostic value, for example, with midwall fibrosis um, compared to its absence in predicting arrhythmias, sudden cardiac death, and overall mortality. So as you've seen today, myocardial changes can occur over a broad range of cardiovascular disorders. Um, we've heard, I think, some of the acquisition and, in, and quantification guidelines cited this morning. Uh, it's really a, important to adhere to those guidelines. But you've seen not only its diagnostic value in different conditions, but also prognostic information with tissue characterization. And we do need to achieve a high bar of evidence to change practice, but this is certainly achievable through registries, multi-center studies, as you've heard about, and other coordinated efforts. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>